So today we're looking at who are, who is, if you want to be pedantic, who is the ruling class? Who are they? Where are they? How do they rule? How do they relate to us? And uh, we've got three fantastic speakers with us today to discuss this question. And as Adrian has just uh, outlined, they'll be speaking for approximately 20 minutes. But first of all, let me give you a brief introduction to all of the panelists. So we are joined by Doug Henwood. He's an influential voice on the US left. He's a journalist, economic analyst, a podcaster, and the author of Take Me to Your Leader, The Rot of the American Ruling Class. Uh, Doug is the host of the popular podcast Behind the News. His writing has appeared in The Nation, Harper's Magazine, Grand Street, The Village Voice, Newsdays, The Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, and Jacobin. And he's also a contributing editor at The Nation. Next up, we have Ho Fang Hong, professor in political economy at Johns Hopkins University. And he's the author of several books, including China and the Transformation of Global Capitalism, Protest with Chinese Characteristics, and The China Boom, Why China Will Not Rule the World. His analyses of Chinese political economy and Hong Kong politics have been featured or cited in publications such as the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg News, BBC News, The Guardian, amongst other publications. And finally, we have Joran Thur Thurborn, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. And his path-breaking book, What Does the Ruling Class Do When It Rules, is a groundbreaking Marxist analysis of the relationship between economic and state power. His other books include Sex and Power, The Killing Fields of Inequality, and The Cities of Power. He's a regular contributor to New Left Review and other journals, and his works have been published in at least 24 languages. So a big welcome to our three panellists. Really excited to hear what you've got to say on this subject tonight. I'm going to call the speakers in the order that I've just um, introduced them. So I'd like to call on Doug first, Doug Henwood, to open up this session for us. Doug, over to you. And just to let you know, I will probably interrupt you around or let you know when you've got five minutes left, just so you can think about wrapping up in the, in the next few minutes after that. But apart from that, over to you. Thank you all uh, for coming. Uh, thanks uh, for having me here. Um, and uh, I apologize for reading a text, but uh, I get nervous without a script. Um, I'll try to keep it to 20 minutes. Uh, I got an eye on the clock. Uh, in preparing these remarks, that old Gayatri Spivak title came to mind, Scattered Speculations on the Question of Value. I don't mean to draw on any more of that article, something I haven't read for like 30 years, but scattered speculations are in the spirit of what follows. If you read my article on the U.S. ruling class in Jacobin, uh, you know that I think it's a pretty debased formation, with few ambitions beyond making as much money in as short a time as possible. Its political wing looks puny next to its ancestors. Its empire is in decline, and its industrial prowess, with few exceptions, is no longer the envy of the world. Where one of the, uh, uh, excuse me, where one of the few countries in the world where life expectancy is declining, mass shootings have become totally routine. In the first 42 days of this year, we've had 66 of them. On a grander scale, as the U.S. is having a hard time adjusting to China's rise alongside our ebbing. I'm not saying the U.S. is an imperial capitalist society is on the verge of collapse. These things take time, but it does seem to be underway. A quick version of my historical analysis is that the WASPy elite that ruled the country from the late 19th century through the 1970s lost its preeminence and was succeeded by, well, it's not really easy to say what, except that it's more mercenary and short-sighted than its predecessor. I don't mean to romanticize the old formation. They're often appallingly racist and eager to follow and then eclipse the English at the imperial game. But it had a coherence and a discipline that seems lacking today when accumulating the maximum amount of money in the shortest possible time seems the prime goal. Before going any further, I should offer what I've, my definition of the ruling class I'm working with. I think it consists of a politically engaged portion of the capitalist class operating through lobbying groups, financial support for politicians, think tanks, and publicity that meshes with a senior political class that directs the machinery of the state. You could say something similar about regional, state, and local capitalists and the relevant machinery. But we shouldn't underestimate the importance of the political branch of the ruling class in shaping the thinking of the capitalists who are often too busy making money to think much on their own or even organize in their collective interest. To me, the US ruling class now looks very deeply split, not just by region, party, and temperament, but also by lines of ownership. In recent decades, we've seen the rise of private models of ownership, like private equity and the large, and the large private corporation. 
During the decade of free money that ran from uh, just after the financial crisis to uh, late last year, there was an explosion in new venture capital financed firms, which once they hit a billion dollars in valuation became known as unicorns. There were even DECA unicorns. By Crunchbase's count, there are about 1,500 of these valued at almost $5 trillion. While some of these companies went the usual route of selling stock and becoming public corporations, an unusually large number haven't. And even of those that did, they waited a long time before doing their initial public offering, their IPO. In the late 1990s dot-com bubble, there was a rush to go public. It seems that many financiers and entrepreneurs have more recently decided they don't want the scrutiny that comes with having numerous outside stockholders. They're not alone in this. According to the World Bank stats, the number of public companies in the U.S. fell by almost a half between the 1996 peak and 2019, the last year they report. Much of that decline came from takeovers, but private equity firms have also taken thousands of public, company private, uh, public companies private over the last few decades. And there have been many fewer IPOs than there were in the 90s. A good deal of business support for right-wing politics comes out of this branch of the owning class, and I would include hedge funds in this category as well. Not only do they hate regulation, as owners of private businesses, they don't, want, uh, they don't have outside shareholders cause, causing trouble. It feeds nicely into the authoritarian social Darwinism that characterizes the milieu. The notorious Charles Koch, CEO of the large, second largest privately held company in the U.S., Koch Industries, has not only showered billions of his, billions of his own money on the mission, but he's organized fellow uh, rich fellow thinkers into doing the same. Many of them, Koch himself, but also characters like Harold Hamm, the fracking billionaire and friend of Donald Trump, are in dirty industries and fight climate science and the inevitable euthanasia of the climate carbon sector. Steve Schwartzman, head of the private equity firm Blackstone, was a Trump advisor and loyalist until that became untenable. Blackstone itself is a public company, at least in name, but Schwartzman holds 42% of the voting rights, and outside shareholders have little say in how the company is run. Although he defended Trump after the Charlottesville race riot, he has since turned on him, but he still supports Republican and right-wing candidates generously. Private equity is driven by an asset-stripping strategy. Coke, Ham, and company are driven by a nature-stripping strategy. Neither is a long-term plan. Now, Schwartzman's turn, uh, is he's not alone in turning on Trump, though he's late to the party. Along with Koch, who never liked him, entities like the Club for Growth are trying to block him from getting the 2024 nomination. But, but while Trump's star has faded some, he still has a lot of loyalists, and the MAGA mass base isn't likely to get excited by anyone the money wing comes up with. This looks to be a split between private capital and the regional pity bourgeoisie that provided something of a mass base. A few words about that mass base. Since the 2016 election, analysts have talked about much of Trump's support coming from a white working class. That's misspecified. Though they may code as working class to metropolitan elites, a lot of these supporters don't have many scratches in the cargo beds of their giant pickups. A two nine, uh, as a 2019 paper by Thomas Ogrzalek and his collaborators put it, they are nationally poor, locally rich. A, bit, a, provin a provincial little bourgeoisie of lawyers, accountants, car dealers, and contractors has long been a base for right-wing politics, but is a larger and richer stratum than it was in the heyday of the John Birch Society. The center left has nothing like this. They, uh, this formation even has the Congressional Freedom Caucus as their, their personal political representative in Washington. The center left does have some billionaires, but they're not organized like the Cook Network and his cousins, nor do they have anything like an ideological, uh, do that, the, anything like the coherent ideology or an ideological distribution system. Koch, following his advisor Richard Fink, followed the Mont Pelerin model of political influence, starting with peak intellectuals like Hayek and Friedman, spreading out and down through think tanks, and then to the pundits and publicists who tried to sell their line to the masses. As Burton Yale Pines of the Heritage Foundation put it back in the 80s, our targets are the policymakers and the opinion-making elite, not the public. The public gets it from them. Central left politics lacks any of the energy or drive that the right has. Its vehicle, the Democratic Party, is haunted by a structural contradiction. It's a capitalist party that has to pretend otherwise, uh, carefully though, for electoral purposes. For the first time in decades, it has a leftish wing and the leadership isn't very happy with it. In early February, 109 Democrats in the House voted for a Republican bill denouncing the horrors of socialism and attributing 100 million deaths to it. That's a, that 109 was a lot more than the 86 who voted against it. The party has more recently reshaped its primary calendar to lead with South Carolina, one of the most conservative states in the country, which is likely to put any leftish candidate at an early disadvantage. 
Sure, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer goes to fundraisers for DSA-affiliated candidates, but he'll be there to guard the means of production if and when it becomes necessary. To some degree, Biden has bent to the influence of that inter internal party left. The pandemic relief bill was very generous, and the infrastructure and climate legislation, while well short of what it should have been, is far from trivial. Biden and the Congressional Democrats passed a bill to subsidize the domestic chip, in chip industry, essentially giving them money, the money they spent on stock buybacks over the previous decade. Uh, this is a form of industrial policy that would have been poison to 1990s Clinton-style Democrats. Largely overlooked in the general discourse, the legislation is offering a big cook kick to unionization as well. As the New York Times put it recently, tucked into all of those laws are measures to give unions the power to effectively tell employers you must pay union scale wages and use a union apprenticeship and training programs, so you might as well use union workers. But there looks to be limited support for these reindustrialization and climate schemes among the big bourgeoisie. When I interviewed the political scientist uh, Alfredo Sanfilo about Brazil last week, he told me that the country's bourgeoisie no longer has a national project. Once it wanted to industrialize, to develop British, uh, Brazilian technology to a world level, then it tired of that and just wanted to speculate and finance in real estate and loot the Amazon. Last time he was president, 2003 to 10, Lula promoted industrialization, a policy that was reversed when the right wing took over. He plans to do it again, but it has almost no bourgeois constituency. It all sounded very familiar to me. It reminded me of the famous passage from the class struggles in France where Marx, descri Marx described how the finance aristocracy in its mode of acquisition, as well as in its pleasures, is nothing but the rebirth of the lumpen proletariat at the heights of bourgeois society. The split within the bourgeoisie is really pronounced on climate. On uh, the class's center left, there's Lawrence Fink, head of BlackRock, uh, the world's largest money manager with $10 trillion sailing under its flag. Fink has made a big deal out of urging his investment, uh, out of using his investment clout to, uh, to promote what in the trade is called ESG, environmental, social, and governance standards. Governance refers to how corporations are run, not to public policy. It's very weak key. A couple of years ago, an alumnus of BlackRock's ESG program, Tarek Fancy, wrote a multi-part polemic denouncing it as pure hot air a sales gimmick concocted by bankers who travel the world in private jets, talking about how bankers can save the climate, but they can't. A large portion of BlackRock's capital is invested in index funds that arrange their holdings to match standard market measures like the S&P 500. I'll have a bit more to say about these in a bit. Since both theory and practice have proved that it's nearly impossible to beat the market unless you're George Soros or Warren Buffett, index funds have come to dominate the investment landscape. But by that dip, but, that by, but by definition, that means that BlackRock is limited in how much of the stocks of malefactors it can sell. It could lobby their CEOs, but since the firm couldn't punish them by selling the stock, the CEOs have no incentive to listen. It can sell the stock of carbon emitters and actively managed funds, but it doesn't really look to have done much of that either. As ineffectual as this all may be, it has enraged the right, which is now in a campaign against woke capitalism or what the irrepressible Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene calls corporate communism. Republican states are withdrawing pension assets from BlackRock management, and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is making ESG into one of the fronts of, in his war on wokeness. Some of this is political posturing, of course, and some of it emerges from the right's view of non-fossil sources of energy as unmanly, but it also reflects the party's heavy financial reliance on the carbon sector. It's long been a voice for dirty industry, but it's only gotten more dedicated to the cause as Dems make gestures in a climate-friendly direction. No other conservative party in the rich world approaches the GOP's level of climate cretinism. But things climate activism, if you can call it that, is unusual in corporate America. And if you think, as I do, that capitalists lack a spontaneously developed politics and must be organized on their own long-term interests by the political class, then Biden's weak leadership and low approval ratings aren't really up to that task of organization. I mentioned index funds earlier. Let me de develop that So, I got interested in ruling class studies when I was writing my book, Wall Street, specifically around the question of who runs large corporations. The answer is not self-evident. By the mid-90s, when I wrote most of the book, the so-called shareholder revolution, which broke out in the late 70s and early 80s, was well along in its work of transforming how corporations are run. In the late 19th and 20th century, as the form of the modern public corporation was taking shape, financiers had the upper hand. They supervised mergers and dominated corporate governance. But with the 1929 crash, they fell into disrepute. 
And in the early decades after World War II, financial operators had almost no influence over management. It was the era of what John Kenneth Galbraith called the new industrial state, when a technocracy allegedly took precedence over pre-crash doctrines of profit maximizations. Corporations were still mightily, mighty profitable in the 50s into the late 60s, or early 70s, but shareholders had become vestigial to how firms were won, run. Share ownership was widely dispersed among millions of individual shareholders who couldn't have come together to speak with anything like one voice. In the early 1950s, households over owned over 90% of stock outstanding, pension funds under 1%, and mutual funds not much more. By the late 1970s, the household share had slipped under 60%, and pension share, a pension fund share had risen to 20%. With the intellectual leadership of finance professors like Harvard's Michael Jensen and the monetary leadership of investment shops like Colbert Kravis Roberts, the era of managerial dominance came to a brutal end with a round of takeovers and shareholder forced restructurings. The techno structure was replaced with an intensified devotion to profit maximization, specifically in the form of maximizing stock prices. The growth, growth in institutional ownership replacing the old individual ownership model made takeovers easier to negotiate and management easier to lobby. To Jensen and his followers, corporate managers were too complacent and not focused enough on getting profits and stock prices up. The point of unwelcome takeover attempts is to wake up the laggards and make some money by slimming them down and putting the squeeze on their workers. As the 1980s turned into the 1990s, pension fund activism replaced shareholder, uh, replaced uh, hostile takeovers as the prime mode of enforcing the new corporate order. The pension fund share of stock ownership hit a high of 27% in 1986, and the household share fell under 45%. The pension fund share would decline as employers cut back on pension coverage, but now the household share is under 40%, and mutual funds are over 20%. While the ultimate beneficiaries of pension and mutual fund assets are individuals, disproportionately better off ones, of course, the money is run by professional managers who are economically and politically part of a financial aristocracy. So entrenched is the practice of maximizing stock prices that firms have been devoting a huge share of their resources over the last few decades to buying their own stock to boost its price. One of the central, one of the central achievements of the shareholder revolution was to transform managerial pay from a regular paycheck into something dependent on the stock price. The point was to get CEOs to think like shareholders and not princes of their own realm. It's largely work. Nothing shows this alignment of interest like the fact that since 2000, big firms have spent just over half their operating profits on buying their own stock. This makes both shareholders and CEOs who are paid by the stock price very happy. Before 1982, such buybacks were largely illegal. Now they're approaching a trillion dollars a year in the US. Keynes was no doubt something of a starry-eyed liberal when he wrote in the wake of the 29 crash, that the point of investment was to defeat the start dark forces of time and ignorance, but it's now hard to believe that this was even once a pleasant myth. The fight over control of big corporations between shareholders, meaning professional money managers effectively, and top management over the last several decades was an interesting intra-family squabble. As every Marxist schoolchild knows, the capitalist class, class owns the means of production, but when you look at the matter closely, the who and how of that are itself evident. And there's a new wrinkle. As I said earlier, index funds of the sort that BlackRock runs, along with BlackRock, there are two other giants, Vanguard and State Street, now own about a quarter of the stock represented by the S&P 500, 500 index, a category that's almost synonymous with corporate America. Among the rationales for making stock prices so central at the outset of the shareholder revolution 40 years ago was that they were supposed to serve as real-time grades in corporate performance because they reflected the wisdom of the crowd, which would buy winners and sell losers. So a low price relative to profits or underlying assets was a sign of chronic corporate underperformance that invited the discipline coming from takeover artists, or as Alan Greenspan once called them, unaffiliated corporate restructurers. But index funds can't sell, which compromises the alleged signaling mechanisms. And the managers of index funds, who seem like sitting ducks replacement by chat GPT, have no incentive to lobby management, and management has no incentive to listen, as I said earlier. So what does ownership mean here exactly? What function, even by the standards of bourgeois finance, do shareholders serve other than extracting value? Maybe it's uh, time to revive Marx's observation that the joint stock company marks the abolition of the capitalist mode of production within the capitalist mode of production itself. 
I can see there are some details to work with here, though. I'll conclude to returning, by returning to a theme I brought up earlier, the shrunken time horizon of the U.S. ruling class. The current Motley crew looks nothing like the set that planned the post-World War II order. They emerged from, or were, as recruits were assimilated to, an ethnically and socially homogenous WASP aristocracy who felt themselves above quotidian distractions and ranked commercial temptations. Of course, it was all in the interest of long-term accumulation under U.S. guidance, but it was quite successfully planned and executed, at least until things started slipping in the 1970s. Now at the U.S., in a long process of imperial decline, our planning elite seems fragmented and lost. You have Republicans criticizing Biden for not having shot down the Chinese balloon quickly enough and Democrats acting as if it was an, as if it was an act of heroism. Our rulers act as, don't act as if they have any good idea about how to cope with the rise of China, except with bellicose and one hopes ineffectual gestures, because God knows we don't want bellicose gestures to lead to an actual war. And we have a capitalist class that's apparently given up in the future, capable of dealing with the climate crisis, a truly dire threat, but also consuming capital rather than investing it. Net investment, net that is of depreciation, by both business and government has been falling relative to GDP for decades. The vast flow of free money and 0% interest rates in the Federal Reserve has been channeled into an impressive set of bubbles, not real investment. It used to be normal to have one particular asset lead the way in a speculative orgy, whether it's stocks in the late 90s or housing in the following decade. Now we've had a bunch all at the same time, stocks, crypto, unicorns, housing, uh, collectible sneakers even. Now we've got uh, uh, these bubbles now have only been partly deflated by the Fed's tightening moves of the last year. And Wall Street is dearly hoping the central bank will reverse these moves in a few months and resume the flow of cheap money. The bond vigilantes of the 80s and 90s, always on the lookout for an inflation that needed to be crushed, have largely disappeared. I'll give the last words to Etienne Balabar, who has diagnosed the afflic affliction uh, sharply. We realize now that our ruling class is no longer a bourgeoisie in the historical sense of the word. It does not have a project of intellectual hegemony or an arti artistic point of honor. It needs, or so it thinks, only cost-benefit analyses, cognitive educational programs, and committees of experts. That is why, with the help of the pandemic and the internet revolution, the same ruling class is preparing the demise of the social science, sciences, humanities, and even the theoretical sciences. See the quote from Bellabar. The bourgeoisie no longer has any civilizational project, national or otherwise. Live for today, and if the water rises, well, just move inland or to an underground bunker. Thanks. Thank you very much, Doug Henwood, for that uh, start to this discussion today on class. I can see people are clapping, quite rightly so. And excellent timekeeping, by the way. You set the bar very high. So without further ado, we are going to go on to our next speaker, uh, Ho Fong Hong. Um, same applies to you, um, approximately 15, 20 minutes, and over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for putting this together, and thanks for uh, getting me on board. And it is really, really, really great to, to, to share the space with uh, all of you and to my distinguished uh, co-panelists. And, and it's good to have uh, Doc opening, as he pointed out, the uh, fragmentation and increasing short-sightedness of and financialization of the, the American voting class that, that I'm going to um uh, 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 start with uh, because uh, in in my uh, recent research and my recent book that I published in 2022 Crash of Empires I look at uh, the dynamics and uh, the underlying forces that create this kind of a US China inter-imperial rivalry and where it is heading to and definitely that uh, the, the US ruling elites uh, the number one uh, global obsession right now um is uh, how to cope with uh, the rising China and uh, Russia is a is is a is is a kind of a uh, 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 concern too. But actually, that some uh, 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 actually the uh, uh, Republican uh, affiliated uh, 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 scholars and actually close to the uh, 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 the previous Republican administration uh, that once told me that actually uh, Russia is uh, is a problem, but it is just a distraction uh, uh, because it can. Uh, he, 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 I think it's hit uh, many uh, ruling elite in, in the U.S. in Washington share his will that uh, Russia can create disruption, but the real long-term uh, challenge that has the capability to to topple the U.S. global uh, the leadership is really China. That uh, Russia will create some short-term trouble, but it is China that 
the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, government unit is really worried about uh, that has a huge long-term impact on its uh, global supremacy. So that uh, in, in, in my recent book in 2022 that I look at the kind of uh, underlying um, inter-elite conflict dynamics that lead to the changing U.S. Uh, policy towards China and also on the China side, how these inter-elite conflicts uh, lead to the changing the China disposition toward the U.S. and the Western um, uh, 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 led the international system. And uh, it is interesting to look at a lot of parallel uh, uh, in U.S. and China political development from the 1960s all the way to today is that in 1960s, both U.S. and China witnessed um, massive uh, uprising in China is in the form of Red Guard's uh, radicalism unleashed by Mao and then put down uh, by Mao himself in the 1970s. And in the U.S., uh, leaders today, it is, there's the student movement, anti war movement, uh, civil rights movement, and the advance of organized labor uh, in the 60s. But then in the 1970s and 1980s, unfortunately, the both place in China and the U.S. are witnessing the, the, the long-term uh, disempowerment. Uh, of massive uh, movement, of mass movement and massive uprisings. And in the case of the US and UK and other Western democracy, there's a, this empowerment of organized labor, uh, retreat of the student women and 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 rise of conservatism. And in the in, in the China after the neoliberal turns, actually before the neoliberal turn in the 1970s, Mao already uh, uh, put back the uh, the G genie of uh, red guard, red radicalism into the bottle, and in the 1970s, they sent all these radical youth to the countryside uh, to maintain the, the dictatorship of the party. Uh, and then in the 1980s, after the neoliberal turn, of course, that it is uh, uh, a period of uh, upheaval and culminate in 1989, um, the, the, the student democratic movement and and some. The, um, uh, leftist scholar in China actually rightly point out that uh, despite the Western uh, characterization of the um, student movement in 1989 as a kind of uh, the, the movement that longed for the Western style democracy, there's a huge undercurrent um, in the movement, student movement in 1989, that, that is the kind of uh, anti liberal uh, thrust among the students. So a lot of uh, 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 the students in Tiananmen Square in 1989 are, are asking for fairness, anti-corruption, and egalitarianism. Some even holding the the, the poetry of Mao in their protest. Uh, but then with the crackdown uh, uh, over the 1990s and uh, thereafter, the rest is history. That in 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 China we witnessed this massive, long-term disempowerment of mass movement. So what happened in the U.S. and China is that this kind of uh, uh, long disempowerment of mass movement uh, in the 1980s and 1990s onwards, uh, one consequence is that what is driving the, the direction of development and also the mutual relation between the two countries are driven very much by inter-elite conflicts. That is conflict between different factions of the ruling caste and also uh, the, the conflict between what I see as a kind of a between the capitalist class, the, the bourgeoisie, the, in the case of China, is the latent bourgeoisie and the geopolitical elite that is driven by nationalism and the territorial, territorialist um, concern of maximizing the, the projection of the power of the state in the, in within the country and uh, and globally. Uh, so it is really this kind of uh, inter-elite elite conflict, not only the inter-capitalist elite conflict, but also the conflict between uh, Marxian uh, capitalist class or Marx defined capitalist class and the geopolitical elites that is uh, can be we can understand more with kind of a barbarian perspective. So it, on the U.S. side, it's interesting to see that uh, Doc is right in saying that uh, uh, after the 1970s, that U.S. Uh, has undergone uh, fragmentation of the elites and increasing short sightedness of the elite, and also the financialization of the elite that is domination of Wall Street over. Uh, industrialists and other faction of capital. And interesting, it is under this kind of fragmentation elite and the short sightedness of it is that uh, create a kind of a condition uh, for U.S. to adopt a kind of a policy uh, that actually facilitate uh, the rise of China in the 1990s and 2000s. That because uh, you look back to history, um, uh, of course, the U.S.-China alliance uh, are ground on the geopolitical uh, uh, common um, uh, uh, concern to defeat the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, so much so that after right after 1989, uh, after the crackdown on Tiananmen, there's a lot of uh, uh, concern about human rights issues in China and things like that. And then the, the senior Bush 
at that time, the 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 uh, uh, wrote a secret letter to Deng Xiaoping that uh, that letter is no longer secret, and it is included in in one of his uh, memoir, and assuring Deng Xiaoping that that no problem that uh, on 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 kind of uh, on the surface we really need to talk about human rights, but uh, the, in essence we really understand how important U.S.-China uh, harmonious relation is. Uh, th at that time, Cold War is still not yet over. Nobody expects Soviet Union will impose suddenly. So, so the, the senior Bush at that time assured Deng Xiaoping that all, all this accusation about human rights violation, crackdown on Tiananmen is only for show. Uh, and U.S. Uh, understand that this kind of a geopolitical interest of the alliance uh, between the two countries is of utmost importance. And he assured Deng Xiaoping that uh, that crackdown uh, won't interfere with the harmonious relation uh, between the U.S. and China. So at that time, the Cold War was still around. So this U.S.-China elite um, uh, um, coalition uh, is ground on this common enemy, uh, that is the Soviet Union. And after the Soviet Union is gone in the early 1990s, uh, the geopolitical elites of the U.S. started to uh, sense, uh, not on human rights ground, but on the ground that uh, China is already starting to be more assertive or even aggressive over South China Sea and over Taiwan and over other kind of spheres of influence that is uh, regarded as uh, U.S. spheres of influence. Uh, so you look at the literature and look at the, the, the policy hawks uh, in D.C. in the 1990s. They, the geopolitical elite in the U.S. already talk about a China threat. Already talk about uh, U.S. really need to uh, up in up the game to containing the China military capability and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, so at that time, if U.S. really uh, the elite put the act together and 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 it is really uh, very uh, uh, possible and possible that uh, U.S. managed to contain China rise. But at the time, uh, the U.S. corporate elite definitely has a very different uh, thinking about China, uh, that they see China as the new frontier of globalization and low-cost labor, definitely. And then among the U.S. Uh, transnational corporate elites, there's different uh, thought about China as well, that initially industrial elites are reluctant to go to China, that there's a lot of documentation of this, uh, for example, southern textile in the uh, industries, the high-tech industry, including Apple, that I look into the case of Apple and uh, uh, how Apple get into totally enmeshed with the China supply chain. And it's very interesting. In the 1990s, um, uh, uh, after Steve Jobs is back in Apple, then Apple is totally not interested in going to China. Uh, and and many many got the kind of biography and and uh, 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 account of a Steve Jobs uh, uh, the style of management. He really want to have the assembly line close to home so that he can land in the assembly line uh, any morning to look at the color tone and details of all the design. And and so Steve Jobs in the beginning was very very uh, reluctant to move. The, the assembly line to China, and then and then in the nineteen nineties, when many the manufacturers started to leave the U.S. to China, uh, Apple is busy uh, expanding its production facility in California and Colorado. Uh, so it is only after the late nineteen nineties uh, when the, the Apple has some the, the product failure, product design failure in the late nineteen nineties that the stock market. Uh, price uh, permit that they hire Tim Cook from the, um, uh, from Compaq uh, to restructure Apple supply chain and then to tell the Steve Jobs that actually that Apple uh, got to move to China uh, to to increase profit and increase the valuation of uh, of Apple stock share price in the stock market. So it is uh, the only after this crisis that Apple actually moved all the way to China. And this story is very similar. Apple is not unique. And many manufacturers or originally were reluctant to move to China because they are not familiar with this, the place there. Uh, they don't know what is there. And then the political uh, uncertainty uh, worry them. Uh, but in the end, it is this kind of uh, uh, shareholder value uh, doctrine uh, driven by Wall Street that uh, uh, that actually in the end dragged this uh, uh, manufacturer to move to China. And after they moved to China, and at that time, the Chinese uh, elite is very... Uh, 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 aware that they lead this uh, American corporation to get the hold on their technology, their market, their design, and everything else. So they uh, uh, throw them a lot of uh, uh, incentive, uh, uh, regulatory incentive, and all kind of incentive, like uh, uh, cheap, even free industrial lands for them to build their factories, 
Uh, actually, in a lot of cases, and, and the, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, mobilized their uh, networks uh, deep in the countryside to help them recruit laborers and then ship them from the countryside to the coastal factories to work for the American factories. So the, the, the China elite is playing this game to, to get all these American corporations in. And then uh, the Wall Street is doing the job of uh, getting any manufacturers in the U.S., uh, that is still in doubt uh, to drag them uh, uh, to China. That is a lot of cases that uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, examples I look at is the, the uh, uh, Derby hoiseries. It is well documented cases. This this kind of a Walmart uh, supplier of uh, socks and uh, um, uh, and all this kind of uh, uh, textile product that originally very reluctant to go to China in the end that they finance here. Uh, Goldman Sachs and all other kind of American bankers that finance the company and just saying that if you don't go to China, we will stop uh, lending money to you. That Because China is where the action is, it is going to ensure the valuation of your stock and things like that. So it's Wall Street that drag all these industrialists go to China. And of course, that organized labor has been uh, kicking and screaming all, the, all, all, all along. And uh, and the 1999 Seattle uh, uprising against the WTO, as people find out, a lot of protesters are actually organized labor. They are against the WTO. They are against uh, factories going to China. But uh, with their disempowerment and declining unionization uh, rate, uh, it doesn't uh, create any effect. So in the end, that Wall Street uh, won the game. And also, Wall Street is playing the game of uh, helping Chinese state enterprise. Um, and Goldman Sachs is the leading one. That uh, to to, to they, they have a lot of business to help Chinese state-owned enterprise to float in the U.S. stock exchange and to in, in the in the stock market in Hong Kong, and in in uh, and in Singapore and in globally, actually, that a lot of Wall Street uh, firms uh, gain a lot of uh, profit by this kind of uh, offering IPO for Chinese state-owned enterprise. So there is this kind of a situation when U.S. corporate elite, led by the spearheaded by uh, by by Wall Street. Um, were in in complete uh, harmony uh, with the Chinese corporate elite, and then and then what you look at in the in the Congress debate about China in the 1990s is that whenever there's a geopolitical elite or ideological co warrior want to float a little bill, targeting China, there will be massive corporate lobby against those those bills. Uh, so the, whenever there's a attempt legislation to contain China, that it won't be even has a chance to be voted on this uh, Senate or, or the House of Representatives for because the most of the time, those bills will be shot down by a corporate lobby. Uh, so uh, it is the situation in the 1990s. So that is the division between the geopolitical elite that already sense a rising China will be a threat to the global supremacy and geopolitical supremacy of the US. They're advocating containing the China when uh, before it is too late. Uh, but their the tendency was... Uh, very much restrained by the corporate elite, transnational corporate elite, that has a good time uh, 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 expanding their operation in, 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 in China. And then interestingly, you look at Donald Trump and then you look at the UK equivalent of Donald Trump that I document. And actually I have this example in, the, in a new article that is coming out in the latest issue of the Jacobins. That is um, before Donald Trump uh, started his presidential bid as a kind of a US president in 2008, and he gave a speech uh, in a kind of a New York City uh, hospitality industry conference in NYU and saying that the uh, U.S. Is, 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 is kind of uh, declining because we have this excessive socialist regulation uh, against construction. I went to Shanghai and then see this guy building thing and dumping the, the, the tens of thousands of tons of dirt into the ocean. And they don't need environmental assessment, impact assessment. They don't need uh, kind of uh, approval from the government to dump this dirt uh, into the ocean. Is why they are doing so great. Uh, while in New York City, he said that we will get an uh, electric chair if I throw a piece of stone into the Hudson River. So he's saying that U.S. is declining because uh, we have so many excessive regulation. And then at the same time in the U.K., there's a U.K. equivalent of Donald Trump, which is a U.K. host of The Apprentice. Uh, Lord Sugar, uh, uh, a, a, a while ago when the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn really has a, look like it, it has a chance of uh, uh, a winning power. And then Lord Sugar in a, in a kind of interview and saying that uh, the interviewers uh, is asking, what will you do if Jeremy Corbyn become the prime minister of the UK? And then his response is that we will all move to China and let UK rot. 
under Jeremy Corbyn. So, so at that time, really, that uh, the the capitalist elite in the U.S. and U.K. and in in in, in 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 everywhere in the Western world really see that 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 they are persecuted uh, by the excessive uh, socialist regulation against their profit making activities. And China is a frontier, a paradise for them. Um, so it is the 2000 and 2010s, but what happened after the 2008 global financial crisis is that um, uh, China uh, has a successful stimulus and then expansion of the state sector at the expense of China's private sector and foreign sec foreign companies in China. And then China enter, start to enter in the long slowdown in the economy. And then uh, the state, uh, the unprofitable and relatively inefficient uh, rent seeking state uh, company uh, uh, become more and more dominant and successfully law of the party state to uh, over all kind of regulatory and policy favor to rescue uh, this state enterprise uh, amidst the falling uh, profits and slowdown of the economy to help them continue to expand at the expense of Chinese private companies and at the expense of foreign company, most predominantly U.S. company. Uh, so that uh, U.S. company in having a business in China starting to be uh, squeezed by the Chinese regulator and Chinese government uh, to, to make room for their Chinese uh, partners and competitors, first in the Chinese market and later in the global market. So the whole point about Belt and Road of China is, uh, is a very global Keynesianism on the China side. That is that they use the Chinese state bank to lend money to all these developing countries and then the, um, the, uh, the, the, the very standard saying is that this Chinese loan to developing country is not like IMF and World Bank loan. They don't have string attached. Uh, they're a lot like IMF and uh, uh, World Bank policy loan, but it is only half true. It has not this kind of policy string attached to this loan, but the, uh, uh, the, it has other kind of string attached. That is when Chinese state bank lend money to Pakistan, for example. The condition is that the Pakistan has to use this uh, borrow money to hire Chinese contractors to use Chinese products. Um, so actually, it is a kind of uh, uh, Keynesianism uh, inside out. That is the Chinese uh, uh, government use uh, government money to lend money uh, to finance projects in developing countries. And then, so there's this kind of developing countries would use this money to buy Chinese products and then to hire Chinese company to do the constructions and so on and so forth. And in the process, and then it pisses uh, U.S. Uh, corporation off because uh, they uh, eat up the U.S. Uh, corporation uh, market share, not only in China now, and now uh, in developing countries market. And then I look at uh, this kind of a documented uh, lobbying effort of U.S. corporation, for example, Caterpillar. Uh, it is uh, documented in the media that they're lobbying the Obama administration to, uh, back in the 2010s to have a free trade agreement uh, uh, with Latin America because that they say that they are losing market share to Chinese uh, the construction machine uh, competitors in Latin American market. So if U.S. didn't uh, have a free trade agreement uh, with Latin America, that Caterpillar will be totally squeezed by the Chinese competitor. So it is the situation that um, uh, U.S. corporations start to feel this uh, pressure and heat of the intercapitalist competition from the Chinese companies, which is supported by the China party state with their industrial policies, with all this kind of reg regulatory and policy uh, uh, favor, uh, so that uh, Chinese, uh, the U.S. corporations stop lobbying for China uh, after 2010, uh, when they become feel themselves become a victims of Chinese industrial policy, and then start to lobby for U.S. industrial policy to help them in the U.S. domestic market and also in the global market. So it's now the Economist uh, magazine is uh, crying for about this. Oh, U.S. is like going the down going down the path of industrial policy. Uh, to supporting the corporations in 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 the global market in the U.S. market, and it is actually that is a uh, lot a uh, kind of a U.S. Uh, uh, industrial policy advocates uh, in Washington against uh, corp corporate interests, and actually that uh, U.S. corporation has been lobbying for industrial policy to compete with Chinese econ industrial policy that uh, uh, that make the Chinese company outcompete them for decades, and then now they finally got it. Uh, so right now. What we see is this kind of alignment of uh, U.S. geopolitical and corporate elite interests in counteracting China and then containing China. Uh, and, and then whether it is too late, it is still too uh, early to say it, uh, whether U.S. can 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 succeed. 
according to Doc, of course, and according to many people, it is already too late. The U.S. is already in decline. But uh, uh, in the last minutes of my my talk, I would like to open up to talk about uh, the issues that actually U.S. has been in decline for a long time since the 1970s. And then in the end, uh, like in the 1970s, it seems like U.S. is imploding. And then Soviet Union seems to be winning the Cold War and, and, and the defeat in Vietnam, the Iranian Revolution. But in the end, that Soviet Union uh, lost the Cold War and not because U.S. is really omnipotent and U.S. is more su having a superior system and more uh, long-sighted ruling class, but, 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 but U.S. emerged triumphant in the Cold War because of the uh, elite conflict and then also the contradiction within the Soviet ruling elite for Soviet bloc that they imploded. And then the other example is Japan that in the 1980s, many people are talking about Japan is going to win over the U.S. In the end, it's not the U.S. Com uh, competitiveness and U.S. innovation or US, U.S. advantage that in the end uh, the win over Japan and Japan in a long decline right now uh, after 1990s. And it is also because of the of the uh, internal contradictions and the elite uh, policies and elite conflicts within the uh, Japan, this ruling class that lead to this kind of a uh, defeat of uh, Japan in its competition with, with, with the U.S. And then whether the same can be said with regard to China that I don't have time to talk about, but I want to open it for discussion. If in the end that U.S. successfully uh, managed to beat back China's advance, it would not be because of uh, U.S. superiority or, or, or U.S. long-sightedness or, or U.S. Uh, advantage, but because of um, that the internal elite contradictions and the internal problems and conflict within China that let them to, um, implode before uh, they really can advance. So, let, But it is a kind of a big question mark that I would like to open it up and then probably we can talk about it in the Q&A section and I look forward to your comments and, and, and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, another brilliant introductory talk there to really set the scene for the conversations and uh, just throwing in a question there for us at the end. Thanks again for that. And hopefully by now, a few of you are starting to think of some questions that you might want to uh, raise um, following the next and final speaker from the panel, who is Joran Thurborn. So without further ado, again, we've had excellent timekeeping from the speakers. I'm sure we'll have excellent time, uh, timekeeping again from Joran. So Joran, I'm going to hand over to you. You've got about 20 minutes. Thank you, <clears throat> and uh, good evening from Europe. Uh, I know it's midday in, in, in Madison, Wisconsin. Let me uh, just say I'm very happy to be reconnected with the Haven Center, where my late friend uh, Eric Wright worked, and, and we sometimes also worked together. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about ruling class rule and its changes, which is not quite the same thing as the uh, question, the overall question of this seminar, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, to begin with, I mean, class is a social force derived from positions in the economic system. And as says the ruling class is not a deciding committee. It acts through a number of collective and individual actors and functions through various social processes and institutions. So to me, the who is who in the ruling class has always been of secondary interest compared to the basis and manifestations of exploitation and power. And thinking of capitalist rule as primarily personal power by a set of individuals would lead us astray. Um, we had better start, I think, from the changing character and processes of capital power. When we have some knowledge of them, we can search for crucial moments of agency uh, with their most significant actors and the reverberations of these uh, uh, actions. So ruling class rule in general means that they class's domin dominant position in the socioeconomic system is ensured and reproduced. And this reproduction has to be secured in three domains. Most directly in the economy, the domination of capital accumulation. And the position of capital accumulation, in turn, 
is dependent on market power and extractive power. Secondly, rule and ruling in modern societies involves a state through which rule is performed. So ruling class rule then has to ensure ruling class representation or at least positive hearing by the state. And furthermore, it has to secure the transmission of class power over the people and over the working classes through the operations of the state. The third domain of ruling class rule is ideology and the cultural sphere, creating the subjectivity of the working classes forming basic systemic acquiescence and adaptation. Loyalty and legitimacy, on the other hand, is not, are not required, though they are, of course, a boon to capital power. So the rest of this uh, short presentation I shall devote to changes in ruling class rule of the world in the last 45 years since the publication of What Does the Ruling Class Do When It Rules? I will start then with capital power in the economy. And the first, the most notable thing here is the extension of market power. Since the crisis of the 1970s, market power has grown enormously in several ways and for several reasons. Industrial outsourcing has integrated a number of poor countries into a worldwide pool of low-wage labor, to which the largest contribution has been the extension of capitalist labor markets to ex-communist Eastern Europe, Vietnam, and China. Free trade has extended product markets. The lifting of capital controls has led to global capital markets. In short, one reason for the strengthening of the market power of capitalism is the process of capitalist globalization. Secondly, with respect to the market power, there is also the structural change of the core of capitalism from industry to finance, the process of financialization, as was mentioned here earlier. This has involved the, the rise of the stock market as the central institution of current capitalism and stock market value becoming the key measure of corporate success or failure. It has even, in a number of cases, proved more important in medium term than profits in product markets. Corporations like Uber and Spotify, for instance, have for more than a decade continuously only made losses on their product markets, but have continued to attract capital uh, and many shareholders, including, of course, the founders, have been made very rich from cashing in the rising shareholder value of the loss-making corporations. Markets have expanded also inside national economies. The size and power of financial markets have grown with the explosive expansion of household and personal debt and credit. And furthermore, there is the marketization of the state itself and on public services and so-called pub new public management. Welfare states and civic rights are being hollowed out by markets being created and extended for education at all levels and for all kinds of health and social care. And classical professional norms of ethic and responsibility are downgraded and subordinated to business considerations. The other pillar of economic power of capital is, of course, its extractive power. 
the power of capital to get surplus value out of its workers and to appropriate income and wealth from the world economy. All this has increased hugely since the 1980s. The global share of national income peaked in 1982 and has exhibited a declining trend ever since then, although with some national variations. And the within country average of the ratio of the income of the top 10% to the income of the bottom 50% is now back at the same level as in 1910. The whole economic equalization of the previous century has been wiped out. There have been five major pathways to this increase of capital's extractive power. Two have been structural changes of capitalism. The shift of primary wealth making from industrial production and product markets to finance stock and real estate markets meant a kind of liberation of capital from labor, from direct dependence on, on workers and on workers' needs and demands. Secondly, uh, globalization made even product uh, made even product making capital little dependent on workers nearby. Instead, production is carried out by workers of competing subcontractors in faraway countries. A new technology-based global monopolies or, or, or oligopolies have made enormous markups possible. It has been calculated that Apple and Samsung uh, rake in about 65% of the price uh, from every smartphone uh, into uh, profits or designer remunerations, 65%. A third route to uh, extending and increasing and deepening extractive power of capital was a large-scale attack in tandem, tandem with states inspired by Thatcher and Reagan, uh, a large-scale attack on workers' unions. This attack meant, met little resistance in most countries, except for the British National Union of Mine Workers, who did fight, but who were defeated by a broad right-wing campaign of policing, financial blocking, and ideological warfare. The anti-union attacks were successful because sustained by the economical structural changes I mentioned about. Since the 1980s, trade union decline has been a worldwide phenomenon. For a short period after the crash of 2008, there were two peripheral exceptions to this rule in South America and more clearly in North Africa, but they were temporary, it seems. Deunionization means, of course, more arbitrary workplace power of capital. Collective bargaining has declined with unionization, but we should notice that it's not in synchrony with each other. In some countries, retained historical regulation makes collective bargaining still cover most of the labor market, even though unions organize a smaller share of the class than in the US. France is the major example of this. The two other tracks to increase capital power was first to undo the 20th century industrial class compromise or as the ILO calls it, standard employment, which became a standard long, long after <coughs> World War II, sometime in the 1960s. Full-time 
of standard employment, meaning full-time, open-ended with uh, work, with regulated working hours, paid vacations, social protection, regulations of firing, including compensation for uh, unemployment. And instead came precarious part-time and fixed-term employment, temporary work agencies, work on call, so-called flexibility to fire workers. Integration poss made possible, made uh, by the increased market power of capital. Two, market power and extractive power, uh, of course, reinforce each other. And in the further development, finally, employers now increasingly hide behind digital platforms and apps, hiring and exploiting not employees, but dependent own account so-called entrepreneurs. Capital and the state. The international social turbulence of the 1960s and 1970s had convinced conservative thinkers and politicians that existing democracies had become overloaded by popular demands and therefore needed to be shielded off from the people, if need be by military dictatorship as in Chile or by less drastic methods of which there are two kinds. One way of shielding Democracy, liberal democracies and the state from the people is by restructuring the state. And there is a large repertoire of measures taken, such as central bank independence, constitutional budget norms, deregulation of international capital and money markets, making states more dependent on the market power of international capital, massive privatization of public services, and marketization of the remaining state, so new public management. The other way of shielding liberal democracies and states from the people is by disorganization and fragmentation of the people. Working class organizations and mass membership political parties generally have been eroded. Corporate finance or political campaigning campaigns has become much larger and more powerful in the US in particular, but not exclusively. Politics has become a profession of lifetime professional politicians with a significant recent input of businessmen in some countries but hardly by any ordinary citizens. The politicians are also surrounded by a thick layer of advisors and aides, often trained by professional think tanks linked to capital. These initiatives have, all, have been, all been successful. And recent political science in the United States for instance, by Larry Bartles and Martin Giles and others, has demonstrated empirically how the policy preferences of the wealthy have been implemented overwhelmingly to an overwhelming extent uh, in comparison with those of the majority of the population. And this has been shown by replicating political science that is to be the case in a number of European countries as well including then social democratically governed Sweden. So also the Swedish social democracy paid more attention to the preferences of affluent citizens and, and capital than uh, its own uh, electorate. In brief, the capitalist state has become much more capitalist as the impact of the rising popular forces of 1945 to 1975 has been reversed with neoliberal reorganization of the state and with the class destructuration of post-industrial capitalism. The change is highlighted by the recent entry 
of businessmen into the limelight of high politics. In the Americas, from uh, Donald Trump in the north down to uh, Macri in Argentina. And currently, Britain and France are currently governed by former investment bankers. There is a new ideological spectrum. The vast strengthening of capital power has been expressed ideologically, first of all, in the widespread loss of any imagination of socialism or of any post-capitalist society. The early 20th century revival of socialist imagination in the Americas from Latin American socialist of the 21st century to Bernie Sanders' democratic so socialism has now been contained. The impact of capitalist power is also manifested in a new, broad, and strong attachment to consumerism, primarily in the global south, where neoliberal globalization and predatory lending did generate a new layer of post-necessity consumers. However, the huge increase of capitalist power has not issued into more popular docility. According to one scholarly account by Erika Chenovitz of Harvard, the 2010s had by far the largest onset of extra institutional attempts of regime change in the world since 1900. Nota bene, mainly liberal, so-called civic regime change attempts, not so much social revolutions. Popular uprisings nowadays rarely call for game or system change, but mostly for more fair play in the really in the actually existing game of capitalism. The resurrection of fundamentalist religions in plural and the revival of xenophobia and racism have also generated a new right with a mass militancy the world has not since seen since the 1930s. The ideological spectrum of the 1970s ran from the right to the far left and has now been succeeded by a spectrum running from the center left to the extreme right. There is a, an important recent change in the world order we have to pay attention to. The world order is currently turning from global capitalist market power to geopolitics of rivaling states. Say, turn from globalization to imperial war politics and geopolitical politics. The US political elite, or perhaps also the corporate elite, found that China was winning the game of capitalist globalization. First the Trump and then more systematically the Biden administration then decided to switch to another, to another world game. Now national interest, national security, an imperial state hierarchy overrun free trade and foreign investment, an economic war is declared. The hot war in Ukraine has accelerated this transition. The now beginning era of global war politics demonstrates the relative autonomy of the state and it complicates straightforwardly decisionist conceptions of a ruling class. It means a weakening of capital's market power in relation to the political and military elite and its new state hierarchy conception of the world. Furthermore, it involves a strategic retreat of the US capitalist state, which hasn't been properly noticed yet, I think. No longer is the United States aiming at governing the whole world as one capitalist market. It is, quote, decoupling, unquote, uh, from China, Russia, and other unfriendly states. This is a very interesting semantic change. Decoupling was the slogan of radical third world economists in the 1970s. 
Sami Amin under Gandhi Frank in Ali. Now it's right wing US government policy. To conclude, the past 45 years constitutes a historical turn in modern social history. The 20th century forward march of labor has been replaced by a backward march of capital to the economic inequalities of the early 20th century. So, uh, returning uh, now to the question of the seminar, who are the ruling class of the world who have brought this about? Well, my humble conclusion is that we have to wait for future historians uh, to answer that question. However, we are getting a grasp of the enormity of the changes and of that trajectory. We are also gathering plenty of evidence against a large number of suspects. But a complex structuration as a class is still opaque, I think. And a final envoy. Capital rule is stronger, harsher, and more secure today than in the 1970s. But it has no tenure. It is facing at least four major factors of insecurity. One is the constant tensions and conflicts accompanying the dispossessions, inequalities, and social exclusions inherent in capital accumulation, calling forth human anger. Secondly, while post-industrial capitalism has no class dialectic, i.e. is not strengthening its adversary through its own development as industrial capitalism, strengthen the industrial working class. But cultural changes have made our country arguably the most rebellious century in modern history. Thirdly, war politics is increasingly uncertain and the unpredictable outcome of war tend to have unpredicted consequences. The war mobilizations going on might very well uh, provide more space for labor within individual countries. On the other hand, this new space, if it comes, does not pose a threat to capital because the, the warring Western politicians are all fighting for the eternity of U.S. capitalist domination of the world. And finally, uh, as a in factor of insecurity of capital power, is of course the big cloud of climate disaster, which has the potential of restricting capital power enormously. Although the potential may very well be stifled by so-called green capitalism and more politics or simply made irrelevant by the utter desolation of an overheated planet. Thank you. Thank you very much there, Joran, a final uh, panelist. Um, and hopefully everybody will join me in a big round of applause. Uh, that was great, really set the scene. And if any, everybody must have a question in their head after that introduction. Right now it's time for the Q&A and I need you everybody to listen up while I give you some instructions as to how this is going to work because we are dealing with technology right so there's two ways you can ask a question first of all you can raise your hand virtually and for those that don't know to do that you click on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and once you do that you'll have the option to raise your hand and then I will see your hand and I will call your name um Alternatively, you can type your question into the chat and I can read it out on your behalf. Um, but if you are going to ask the question yourself, we'd ask that you also turn your video on as well if you can. In order that we can keep the conversation going and get as many questions, contributions in as possible, I would ask you to be succinct and avoid repetition and deviation. Um, but apart from that, we are ready to go. So. I am going to open up 
the floor to questions. And um, we've had a request while we wait for some hands to come up to see um, from Joran if it's possible to get a written version of your remarks that you've just given um, and lots of compliments coming in through the chat as well. So who would like to kick off with a question? Hi, my name is Steve. I'm with Seattle Revolutionary Socialist. Um, thank you very much. It's been excellent presentations. Question to Doug or anybody else. Um, your article in Jacobin seemed to imply that there was a division between the local capitalists who are more likely smaller scale or more likely to support Trump versus the larger scale capitalists who are less or more likely to support Biden. And I'm wondering if you still see that or if you think you know, from your analysis today that the large capitalist class is also pretty much moved to the right. Um, is there a constituency in the capitalist class, the big billionaires and so forth, for the more industrial policy or kind of long-term rational approach rather than just get rich quick immediate uh, demands of the uh, smaller... Sorry, yeah, sorry. So could you, could you please... Uh, summarize your 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 question in in a few words because uh, I, the transmission to Sweden I mean is not is not optimal so I I am not quite sure I, I I got everything. Okay, sorry. Okay, is here now um, a strong constituency within the ruling class, the bigger elements, the billionaires, and so forth, for a more long term rational approach on the, to American capitalism, or has it all switched over to just the get rich quick immediate approach? Thank you. Thank uh, you there, Steve. Okay. Uh, we will take a few, we'll take a couple more questions and then I will invite um, the panelists to come back in and respond. So you're up next, Nick. A very quick question, and I've already kind of like put it in the chat, but um, how and why does neoliberal globalization turn into like what's going to become Cold War uh, number two? And how, how have the, elite, the elites been involved in, in, that, in that morphing? What, what is their interest? Why did that happen? Because we've heard that financialization led to outsourcing, which led to kind of like a far more integrated and, and global economy. and now, I've heard of friendshoring very briefly, but the, that seems to be more kind of like rhetoric than anything real. Um, so just just thoughts on on that kind of issue. Why has glo neoliberal globalization turned into like World War II? Is it to do with like the lack of profitability of capital? Uh, okay, thank you. Mm. Okay. Well, while we wait for some other people to get, to get their thoughts together, I why don't we get our panelists to respond to those initial questions? So I think the first one was uh, directed at you, Doug, if you want to come back on that, and then um, any of the other panelists that want to come in and respond to Nick's question, maybe. Doug? Yeah, I, okay, yeah. I did write a bit of that article about the local capitalists, um, uh, the local ruling classes. Uh, and in that, I linked to a piece by um, a historian whose name I now forget it. But he wrote about uh, the, the aristocracy <laughs> around uh, Yakima, Washington, a bunch of uh, people who basically service the uh, fruit orchards out there. And it was an interesting study of how a local or provincial ruling class operates. And the contrast with Seattle, uh, the nearby metropolis, was very stark. Uh, the, the Yakima guys gave, they didn't have very much money, but what they had, they gave to Republicans. And uh, the, the Seattle elite gave mostly to Democrats. So there is that split in places, especially like, like Seattle and you know other uh, metropolitan areas in the, in the northern part of the country. Uh, I think there is um, there's certainly some big capitalists who are quite conservative in their views. But now we see this war going on now between you know Ron DeSantis and the Disney Corporation. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, and the far right of the Republican Party in general is really very hostile to what they see as woke capital. So there does seem to be some kind of conflict. Um, woke capital, of course, is just in it to make money. It's not like they're uh, necessarily uh, a highly enlightened people, but they do tend to be somewhat more cosmopolitan uh, than uh, than the, these far right politicians. So uh, it's quite possible that the uh, the big capitalists would like a moderate Republican Party that was not not as as troubled by uh, people like AOC as the Democratic Party is, 
But um, they don't really have much choice at this point. The, the Republican Party has become just you know, almost exclusively very right wing formation and is heading more in that direction every day, it seems. Um, so I, I think they, whatever their wishes, they may not have much choice at this point. Um, I just want to also um, uh, provide a footnote to uh, something uh, that uh, Hong Fong Kong said. Um, I was very interested to hear that uh, um, industrials were reluctant to move to China at first. Uh, years ago, I know I knew someone uh, who's doing an economics PhD at the New School, uh, uh, and she was writing about um, you know, how in the 1950s, U.S. capital had to be pushed to invest in Europe to create the what then you know soon became the the modern multinational corporation. Uh, and she knew this, or is interested in it, because her father was uh, the Commerce Department official who was pushing that. And at that point. Uh, big U.S. companies did not really want to make those foreign investments. They were preferred to stay at home and were not really interested in expanding into Europe, and they had to be prodded uh, by a government official. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that how the role of government is being played by the financial markets in prodding them into doing something they don't want to. Um, we are seeing some um, you know, um, onshoring or reshoring, whatever they're calling it these days. Uh, I have a friend who's a real estate banker in South Florida, and he says, Oh, there's a whole lot of uh, activity in warehouses and factory spaces in the Upper South going on now as uh, responding to money in the Inflation Reduction Act and such, uh, uh, building batteries for electric cars, uh, you know, building the infrastructure for, for chip investments. So it does seem that um, that money flow is starting to have an effect. It's not really visible in a big way yet, but it does seem like it could be a transformation. I don't see a great lobby in the... Um, in the industrial sector uh, for some kind of coherent industrial policy. But uh, that may change as the money starts flowing. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I don't know if Ho Fong or uh, Joran want to quickly respond to the yeah, other questions. I can quickly respond to Doug and the and, and, and leg questions. Uh, first, the industrial policy that uh, there's no uh, coherent like um, a think tank to advocate it, uh, but uh, Travel of Commerce and American Manufacturing Association that is very interesting that um, uh, in early 2017, right when Trump uh, inaugurated uh, as the U.S. president, actually that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has uh, kind of joined report with the American Manufacturing Organization to advocate uh, the U.S. government to be tough on China and to uh, adopt a lot of policy to increase uh, uh, industrial uh, manufacturers' competitiveness in the competition with the Chinese uh, corporations. So it is the the kind of a not exciting manifesto, but a quite a co 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 coherent doctrine, and it's very interesting, of course. And in the end, it is a Trump that uh, framed as a kind of a president who turned uh, hostile to China and started the tariff and things like that. But in 2016 and early 2017, and actually a lot of American corporations worrying that Trump is going to be pandering to China. Uh, they 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 think that Trump is going to had to deal with China and sacrifice their interests. And then so they they push very hard for uh, more proactive policy from, from the government uh, uh, to protect their interests and in competition with with, uh, with the Chinese corporation. And the question about why neoliberal globalization uh, turned into Cold War 2.0, actually that uh, now that is without doubt, this the kind of a neoliberal free trade globalism as we know is, is, is in crisis. And, uh, but in, to compare in in historical moment in the uh, the historical moment in the late 19th century and early 20th century, we see the exact same thing happen when the British hegemony and free trade imperialism is replaced by the inter inter imperial rivalry uh, between Germany mostly and and France and 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 UK and that's something about the law of motion of capital that is universal and uh, led to the inter imperial rivalry back then and led to the, the inter imperial rivalry now that you look back to the debate between Kowski and Nadine that uh, motivate Lenin to write the imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism is very interesting because Kowski wrongly predicted that this kind of a globalization will lead to this kind of a all major imperial power, Germany, France, uh, Russia, UK will divide the world together and 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 share the, the booty. And then there will be a very stable formation of what uh, Kowski called ultra imperialism. There will be low war, perpetual peace among this imperial power that they agree with one another, divide the world. And letting say, no, 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 that uh, letting features of uneven combined development is that this imperial power, balance of power is in fruit. Uh, so the, the 
original um, agreement to divide the body of imperialism among imperial power at one point will not work at the second point when a late coming imperial power, which is Germany, uh, think that they are stronger, they want a bigger share of the body um, with the UK. And then the conflict in, uh, uh, emerged and then it led to inter-imperial rivalry, inter-capitalist competition, and then world war. And then a similar thing happened today that in the 1990s and 2000s, then China accept its role as a kind of a junior partner in globalization and right on the back of uh, US cooperation with technological advance, advantage and everything else. And then so it play along with the US uh, liberal globalization project. And it seems that's very peaceful, US and, and, and China. And, and, and at that time, there's the, all the talk about Chimerica, G2, uh, co-governing a kind of a liberal order. But now that uh, particularly after the global financial crisis in 2008, then and China's uh, corporate interest and elite think that uh, China is strong enough uh, to have a bigger share of uh, of 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 booty, uh, a lot to let the uh, U.S. take the lead and 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 share the, the most of the the goodies. Uh, so they want to challenge it, and then the U.S. Uh, corporation start to feel the uh, feel the pressure, and then the whole thing fall apart. And then neoliberal globalization and free trade only is advocated when the ruling elite in the U.S. think that they are uh, they are unchallenged and they're dominant. So it is that free trade only advocated by people who think that they can dominate the whole uh, global free market when they feel that they are no longer uh, unchallengedly competitive and they will have uh, competition. They will start to advocate protection from the state. They will start to advocate industrial policy and in interventionist uh, uh, policy. So it is how... It uh, worked out now that uh, when U.S. corporations think that they are unchallenged everywhere in the world, they advocate neoliberal globalization, free trade, small government, so on and so forth. But now that, that they feel that they are under intense competition from mostly Chinese competition under the Chinese uh, the state's industrial policy protection, so they 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 are they are looking forward to the same. And then the last uh, thing I want to say is that that is a Foundation right now, a very famous foundation that I don't want to name it here publicly. That is uh, funding all this uh, 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 research on post neoliberal world order, and interestingly, that this foundation does sharing money not only to progressive and left wing people and and scholars to research on post neoliberal possibility, but they also uh, finance a lot of uh, Trumpist think tank uh, to research on industrial policy. So the industrial policy and government intervention is very popular in both of the left and the right right now, and then so this. Uh, post neoliberal imagination and, and government intervention is up or grab. And whether it is uh, moving toward the right wing direction or left wing direction, um, uh, it is really, really uncertain. And it is an open question mark. And then we need to really think about how to, to move this uh, toward a more uh, progressive and liberational uh, direction. Thank you. Thanks very much. Ho Fung. Um, we're getting a few more people with questions. So before I ask uh, the panelists to come back again, I'm just going to give you a few more questions. One's come in through the chat, which I'll read out now while David Jameson gets himself ready to ask his question. So the question I've got through the chat is from Consuelo Peters. Uh, do you see taxation of robotic labor to replace lost payroll tax revenue? Okay, and now I'm going to hand over to David. And if you can put your video on, oh, followed by Pete Romand. So over to you guys, David. Yeah, thanks very much for those talks. Three really interesting um, conversations. I'm going to put my video on right now in the hope that it doesn't go on the blink as it sometimes does. Um, but there we go. Uh, my question is about kind of taking on from where um, Ho Fung left off there about the relationship between ruling class formation and war policy or at least the growing geostrategic competition between the united states and um china um i could be wrong about this but my feeling is that historically war is often a moment where um ruling elites can be disciplined behind the state project and there's um kind of force from state managers to say get in line behind our protectionist policy or our military industrial policy um or whatever um but I'm interested, um, uh, Doug spoke about, um, you know, the, the, the schisms in the American ruling class being reflected in the party structure between the Democrats and Republicans, including on the right of the Republicans and the kind of freedom caucus element. What I've been surprised by so far is, given the importance of so-called Chimerica, of the kind of economic nexus that's so vital between China and the United States, 
that there's been so little distinction when it comes to the issue of China as a perceived military and political threat. So, you know, both Democrats and Republican mainstreams are um, quite very hostile to China, and there's a real feeling that their hostility to Russia in the present period is seen as part of a Chinese pivot. It's seen as part of, we need to put Russia back in its box so that we can turn to China. Whereas on the right of the Republicans, the attitude is we shouldn't be so concerned with Russia because we need to jump to China straight away. So there's kind of two different ways of making a kind of anti-China pivot. I suppose my question is, surely there are differences in the American ruling class when it comes to the relationship between the United States and China, given how invested some parts of the American ruling class are in that relationship. Might they manifest in different attitudes towards hostility to China? And just quickly to Paul Fung, I mean, I just want to ask about the other end of that. I don't know much about the politics of the Chinese Communist Party. Are there any splits in the Chinese elite when it comes to relations with the United States? Is there a more hawkish element and a more dovish element? Are there people who want to maintain the so-called Chimerican relationship? And are there people who are willing to risk that for a more um, kind of forward geostrategic strategy in China. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. Um, and I'm going to ask Pete Ramand to come in with his question, and then we'll go back to the panellists again. First, thanks very much to all the speakers. That was really fascinating. I really enjoyed um, all your contributions there. Um, so my question is this. It strikes me that uh, within sociology, for example, the extent to which there are serious and robust studies of ruling class uh, and capitalist power, um, the emphasis on studying that seems to have uh, dissipated a little bit. It feels like uh, within sociology, so much work used to be done on that. Now there seems to be far more focus on, for example, looking at... Um, uh, perhaps see transformations at a molecular level using frameworks like intersectionality politics uh, and so on. There's been a shift in sociology towards studies of uh, people on the ground, if you like. And I'm just interested in, for, for all three, you, to all three of you, I'm just interested if you have any thoughts on how the left can rebuild um, a robust research framework for thinking about uh, ruling class power uh, and, you know, uh, how to, I mean, I'm particularly interested in research agendas so that we can uh, punch up, if you like, whereas sociology increasingly feels like it's focusing on punching downwards. Thanks, Pete. Um, okay, well, we've had three questions there. I'm going to invite our panellists to come back in. Uh, I don't know if you're on, if you'd like to come back in, in on any of those points first. And then I know, again, that Ho Fong and Doug, you've okay. been um, invited to respond directly. So you're on. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Pete. I, I mean, I've that this is a, a kind of change in sociology, which is part of a general, a general uh, tendency. I mean, for studies of, of capitalism, capitalist power, uh, to uh, recede in 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 relation to to a myriad other uh, forms of of power and discrimination and so on, the myriads. Um, and um, I don't know what can be uh, done to, to change the trend, but the, 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 the important thing is, of course, I mean, for those of us who, who, who think that macro relations of socioeconomic and political economic power are important, that we take every opportunity to to develop our analysis. And uh, this now, I mean, there is a major uh, challenge, an opportunity, which is the, the, the ongoing turn from capitalist globalization to imperial geopolitics. And uh, there's a lot of work to do uh, in order to to understand how did this happen, uh, and uh, also uh, politically, I mean, what can be done about? It? Because I mean, we shouldn't be uh, uh, blind to the fact 
that is an, is an extremely dangerous development uh, for the whole planet, for humanity. I mean, we are uh, the the Biden uh, regime uh, is leading has led us back. I mean, to the the summer of nineteen fourteen, uh, just before the outbreak of World War One. The crucial difference between 1914 and 2024, say, are the nuclear weapons. And uh, what can be done about that? And we know, fortunately, I mean, that there was in, in the earlier post-war period, before uh, the reign of capitalist globalization, there was something called a peace movement and an anti-nuclear movement, which was a broad left-wing mass movement, uh, primarily in, 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 in Europe and Japan, but, but also in, in the US and other, other parts of the world, which actually managed at least to make the public and the general opinion aware of that these nuclear powers were not just, I mean, some kind of toys which politicians and military could play around with uh, at their pleasure, but was an existential threat to humanity and had to be uh, uh, guarded by, by regulations and rules and attempts at non-proliferation. That was a major uh, victory, at that, half victory. And that is something which uh, we have to bring in uh, because it it's it's goes tied up with the uh, particularly in the United States where uh, the new or in 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 Germany where the militarization of the states of the U.S. and Germany particularly I mean uh, means the enormous profits and enormous growth of a particular sector of big capital, and which needs to be analyzed uh, closely and to see uh, what, and to expose the, the dangers and the risks involved. Otherwise, I mean, the, uh, as I said, I mean, it, the situation now is eerily resemblant of the summer of 1914. And many of us on the left have or should have some kind of the same despair as Rosa Luxemburg felt in the summer of 1914 when the labor movement, the mainstream labor movement, uh, uh, entered the bandwagon into war and marched into World War I with trumpets and, and, and drums and flying banners to the enormous slaughter. Uh, so the, the uh, analysis of macro, macro structures of power, of class and state, have become more important than the more peaceful times. The stakes are much higher now, and we should be aware of that. We should analyze the risks and the dangers and expose the driving forces to war. Thank you. And just to remind our other panelists of uh, the questions that have been raised, uh, one was uh, around, are there differences in the US ruling class um, towards the relationship with China. And, and there was also that question about uh, taxation of um, robots if the payroll taxation is decreasing. I don't know. Uh, would Doug, would you like to come back first? I know you've got to make a fairly sharp exit. Um, yeah, I do have to be off at three or a little after. Um, but I would say on the robots question, I have a simple answer to that. I just don't think robots are going to replace human workers in any large degree. We've been hearing this story for decades, and uh, 
it's yet to arrive. And they'll certainly replace people in certain fields. And now, of course, everybody's obsessed with chat GPT. But uh, I don't know. I just, we've been hearing this for centuries. I just don't think it's going to change the nature of work. Yes, yes, yes. But I don't think the mass replacement of human workers, I just don't see that as about to happen. Um, on uh, the uh, what happened to turn neoliberalism into Cold War 2.0? or the threat of something worse, um, China became much more uh, significant as a rival. It stopped being a, uh, a subordinate, which was quietly stuffing uh, circuit boards and started developing its own technologies, its own political ambitions, uh, and just becoming a much more robust, uh, rich, and powerful competitor to the US. And I don't think US is really um, pleased with that. Uh, it does, the US doesn't like any rivals, and there's really not that much it can do about China, but it's going to try. Um, on the, the the Russia issue, oh, well, I mean, let me say, I don't think there's too much of a difference between the two parties on uh, um, hostility to China. Uh, Trump obviously had a deep personal racist animus against China. You could hear it the way he spoke. I think the uh, the Democrats largely avoid the uh, the cheap racism, but um, there is still this deep sense that China is a rival we have to contain or deal with somehow. Uh, on Russia. Uh, the liberals and Democrats have just been psychotic about Russia now since the 2016 election, seeing Russian influence everywhere. You know, it's just interfering with everything. They're, they're, they're causing racial conflict in the United States, which is a preposterous claim. Uh, they brought us Trump. They, they squashed poor Hillary. Um, uh, so the, uh, I'm not going to sit here and defend the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's a grotesque thing. But on the other hand, there is this... Um, absolute hostility uh, to Russia, and they, they really do seem to want to bleed it dry and eliminate Russia as just any kind of threat. And you even hear some like think tank types talking about the breakup of Russia or breaking it up and deposing Putin and all kinds of really insanely aggressive things that seem very unwise. It's become, <clears throat> there's almost a McCarthyite atmosphere around this. You, if you talk about peace talks or the need to try to comes to some kind of, kind of negotiated end to this conflict, uh, you're treated as a stooge of Putin. I haven't called that pretty much. Uh, and it's it's a frightening environment. Uh, and I think part of it is that animus that Democrats have against Russia, which is really uh, given an emotional bite to their um, eagerness to destroy, destroy the Russians. Um, on the issue of what happened to ruling class studies, I, I think it's a very interesting thing. I think I have my own personal psychopathology in developing a uh, a love hate relationship with the ruling class, uh, given my own personal history, which I wrote about in the Harper's piece about the wasps, but um, I think you know, it's also been the vogue. I'm not an academic, I'm not a sociologist or an academic of any kind, but um, it does seem that the vogue has been to study down to you know bottoms up kinds of history, um, and uh. It's seen as you know great man theories and such uh, to study uh, elites. I think that's really a terrible oversight because in a society as hierarchical as this, uh, how the elites rule and who constitutes those elites and what they what their interests are and how do they you know, what their aims are, these are extremely important things. How they've changed over time also very important, and uh, we really need uh, more people looking at this and rather than fewer. And it's, it's unfortunate that the fashion has been it seems against it. Thanks very much. We're nearing the sort of end of the uh, session, but I would like to ask um, Ho Fung if he's got any comments on the question about the relationship with the US uh, and China. Uh, I can actually answer the two questions into in the one answer. That is the question about sociological uh, theory about the ruling class and uh, internal division among the Chinese elite and the US-China ruling class relation. Uh, in the sociological study of of the ruling class, of course, that, that we are all in a global capitalist uh, uh, system, and 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 uh, the capitalist class is definitely ruling class in everywhere. But we we need to uh, be put back more emphasis on the the geopolitical elite that operate in a slightly different logic of uh, territorialism, rather than capitalist profit making. And and of course, in many times in many countries, like in the U.S., in most time, uh, the the capitalist uh, interests and the territorialists and geopolitical interests of the elite coincide, but in many moments and in many countries, they are not necessarily in line um, uh, together. Uh, for example, in the case of China, that uh, the, my my favorite story to keep uh, that I keep telling is that when China Bomb was translated into Chinese in Beijing, 
uh, they didn't cut out and censor anything that I think that they would uh, censor about, about the 1989 democratic movement and things like that. But the Chinese translation and, and uh, systematically um, alter one phrase that I use uh, throughout the book. That is whenever I mention capitalism in China, in the Chinese translation, they change it into market socialism with Chinese characteristics. So it's like a taboo to talk about there is a capitalism in China then, but actually there's some substantive um, meaning to it because uh, in the Chinese constitution that they recognize profit motivate motivations and, and, and all these kind of market relation. But uh, there's one thing that is uh, the party state is adamantly uh, uh, uphold to, that is the absolute uh, private property rights, uh, uh, particularly private property right of land is still not constitutionally uh, protected. So when you buy a piece of land, a factory land or apartment, you only have a kind of a, a time limited use right of this piece of land that the state can take back any time and then they also need to renew it and you pay a fee. There's a debate within the party about whether uh, to establish private property right of land, uh, but they, they didn't do it because uh, they um, uh, make sure that the party state is actually the ultimate owner of all property, particularly land property. Uh, as the, actually the key to the survival of the of the one party rule, so it is the kind of a territorial logic of maintaining control at the expense of the long term accumulation of capital. That that is uh, in in showing in full here that uh, uh, in China you have the party state, you have state enterprise, and then you have the private enterprise. The private actually that's one last leg of uh, the foundation of U.S. hegemony is the primacy of the U.S. dollar. Uh, that it enable U.S. to borrow a huge amount of money and, and, and maintain an outsized military apparatus and also suck in global capital from around the world to finance all this innovation and big tech and things like that. And then the people are puzzled. Why after the end of the gold standard in 1971 that the U.S. global dollar hegemony can, can, can uh, still maintain its hegemony? And then you look at China currency that I, I think that many people are right by pointing out that provided with the economic size of China and and and, and all factors, the Chinese currency is actually it could have challenged the US dollar hegemony. But the one only factor why the US, uh, the Chinese currency is not yet managed to, to, to challenge any US dollar is because that uh, the party states uh, prioritize its control of the economy and the country over uh, the uh, primacy. Uh, global primacy of its currency, so that uh, they refuse, they are reluctant to allow the Chinese currency to become freely convertible. So it's low, not yet a liberalized and freely convertible currency. So far as the currency is not freely convertible, that that uh, it can never uh, outmatch uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, currency, and not even challenging Japanese yen and British pound and the euro. Uh, so it is the one example why that this kind of territorial, this, this logic of the party state to control actually is suiting its own foot by uh, making sure that China is not uh, as uh, challenging to the U.S. as it could have been. Um, uh, and, and, and there's another example that, for example, the private enterprise in China, the big tech is actually already the outcome in Amazon and all these uh, U.S. tech, tech company. Uh, in in the global market, but then now that they are cracking down on big tech, the party state, because they become too big, that the, the Xi Jinping worry that they they become a challenger. So, and it's interesting that the, all this kind of a big tech in China is Chinese company, but they are incorporated in Cayman Islands. Uh, Tencent and Alibaba is actually both uh, Cayman Island company. And then when Xi Jinping start to crack down on big tech, you notice in the statistic there's a huge surge in foreign direct investment from China to Cayman Islands. Uh, so definitely this FDI from China to Cayman Island is not uh, real investment in factories by the beach or for something like that. It's just capital flight. Uh, so it seems that that, that there's a party state's um, imperative of control and this territorial this logic uh, is at odds with the capitalist interests of, 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 of Chinese capitalist system. Uh, and then it, it make China actually uh, weaker than it could have been. It is already very strong, but it could have been stronger. Uh, in terms of its competition of the U.S. capitalist uh, ruling elite. So the, it is my two responses to this, that one response to the two questions. That is uh, the question of the about theory that we really lead to the, this entangle analytically, the territorial logic of geopolitical elite and the capitalist elite. And in that regard, that it explains why the, China is uh, not yet capable of um, challenging the U.S. Uh, 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 for real, even though it has the potential to do it.
Thanks very much. Well, we're in the final few minutes now, so I'm just going to ask uh, maybe uh, Joran if he's got any final comments uh, to close this uh, part of the session, and then I'll hand back to Adrian to fill you in about the other sessions that we've got in this series. So, Joran, would you like to speak? Well, I I, I think we we should face the question uh, about I mean, who are really the the ruling class, uh, uh, and to what extent? I mean, is the ruling class a a a essential, in, in indispensable, analytical concept? Um, I think it is, but it's uh, we should. I think we should be aware of that. It is a a major and fascinating, intellectual and politically interesting and important challenge to analyze the the structuration of all these individual uh, business leaders, business owners, uh, politicians, think tanks, geopolitical uh, 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 military figures, and so on, how they coalesce and how they uh, connect into a, a dominant uh, block of power, uh, and and I think we should admit, as a uh, conclusion from all of us, that uh, this question is is still not answered. I mean, we are still very far from any uh, analysis which is up to the the, the complexity of this uh, structuration, and particularly, of course, on a global scale. It's much, it's much easier to, to to discuss it on a, uh, on a national case, even if it's a big country like the United States, but the capitalist world is not just the United States and U.S. capitalism. So we need to have some kind of uh, grasp of uh, how the different capitals and capitalist institutions of the world are interconnected. And I think this is something which will come. I mean, in, in that sense, that's my answer to, to Pete, I think. I mean, that, that there, will, there will, in the rather near future, I mean, there be, will be a breakthrough of our studies of this, uh, of this sort. We haven't seen them yet, but, but uh, they, we, have, we have got, for instance, as a very important advance, the studies of political scientists of the relationship between the preferences of the of the bourgeoisie and the preferences of the majority population and how the government handles that. We have that sort of in expressed in in regression coefficients and and with uh, margins of 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 error and all that and so on. So. Um, but those of you, I mean, who are in 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 Pete's or Pete's age and and generation, uh, if you want to uh, make a stunning career in political sociology, uh, the uh, analysis of the global structuration of capitalist power into a global capitalist uh, class is a uh, is a is a fascinating mind-blowing task and, and would deserve, uh, well, the Nobel Prize is out of reach, but there will be uh, a, a whole by prize for the, a breakthrough in this kind of studies. Thank you. And uh, some, some thoughts, food for thought there at the end. Uh, obviously, this has just been the very, very beginning of, of a discussion that will be ongoing. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists once again. Uh, for their amazing contributions to this uh, to this session this evening and to all of you for coming along and those of you that have asked your questions. Uh, it's been a pleasure hosting this meeting, but I'll hand over now to Adrian just to fill you in briefly about what to expect in the next sessions in the series. So uh, first things first, I want to say on behalf of the Havens Right Center for Social Justice and Contour, I'd also like to thank Doug Henwood, Ho Bong Hong, uh, Joran Terborn, and of course, Sarah Bennett, 
as well as uh, you, the audience. Uh, thank you for joining on our first uh, panel on class uh, that will occur in spring 2023. As Sarah mentioned, we are going to have two additional panels, one on the professional managerial class. What is it? What does it do? Why is it around? And of course, um, a panel on the working class in April. You can find out more about those uh, panels on our website. Um, please visit www.havensrightcenter.wisc.edu. I would also encourage you to check out Contour's website as well. It's contour.scot, C-O-T. And I would uh, just one more thing, like to, to say thanks um, again to all of our panelists for helping us tease out uh, some of the tensions within the ruling class, um, both um, within states as well as between them. And there were a number of delightful dissertation projects uh, put forth by today's panelists, uh, future academics of the world, please take note. We will see you again soon. Take care. Thank you.